Hi, everybody. I'm Maggie Burnett Stogner, Executive Director of the Center for Environmental Filmmaking at Washington, D.C. And it is my great pleasure to be here today with another finalist for the Impact Campaign Media Awards for Jackson Wild 2020. So please welcome Malika and Nitya. I'm such a pleasure. Did I say? Hey, hi, Maggie. Hi, it's such a pleasure. It's really, um, your film is extraordinary. It's so powerful. I really enjoyed watching it and, and reading your impact campaign and understanding more about what you were trying to do with it. Um, I would really love for you to take us back to those early discussions you were having about why you were doing this film and what kind of impact you wanted to have. So I think that very often as documentary filmmakers, you make a lot of films, right? But I think there are some documentaries that are special, some documentaries that you really want to see through until the end. And I think with the manta ray documentary specifically, given that the species hasn't received international broadcast attention in the way that it should, given how charismatic and threatened it is, we knew from the beginning that we needed to make sure that our film was making a tangible difference. And um, the film kind of follows the journey um, of manta rays from the fishing markets in India to the Indo-Myanmar border where they are trafficked in large numbers. And then finally to the wildlife markets of Hong Kong and Guangzhou. I think the story is a lot more relevant now given the context of COVID-19 and the implications of the wildlife trade on human health. But at the time, we just wanted to follow the entire trade pipeline. And when we realized the scale of it, when we realized how much contraband was being sent across from India all the way to China, we realized that we needed to do something to stop this, both from a supply perspective and from a demand perspective in Hong Kong and Guangzhou. And that's and so ambitious. Go ahead. Sorry, go. I think from the very beginning, uh, we were clear that we want this film to be able to bring in some kind of policy uh, protection for manta rays in India. This was right, was some of the very first conversations that uh, Malaika and I had about the film, uh, this was on our mind that, you know, we should try and make a film that can actually um, bring about awareness, but also have some kind of policy impact. And we're still working towards that. That's our, that's our big goal. Uh, but that was very much on our minds from the very beginning. Um, from the very moment that Malaika actually found mantas being hunted in, you know, along the east coast of India and when we started talking about documenting this and telling this story. I mean, it's not everybody that, that thinks, oh, you know, there's, there's some animal out there that's being threatened or, so, I mean, what was it that actually connected you to the manta and, and how you found out about that? What, what was that catalyst that just, you know, got you started on, on this really amazing, very ambitious project with such passion? Thank you. I think that I've, you know, spent a lot of time diving with these incredible animals. They're so sentient. They're some of the most intelligent beings in the oceans. And when you've spent time with a manta ray underwater, it's cheesy, but it does change you. It makes you feel different things. It makes you feel butterflies in your, in your heart, right? And I think that um, I grew up actually diving with manta rays in different parts of the world because I've just been diving in different places as a dive master and for work. But when I realized that manta rays were in my own country, I was shocked because, you know, very often we see these animals in pristine blue waters and that's the image of manta rays really globally. But the fact that these incredibly charismatic animals can exist in murky brown waters doesn't make them any less worthy of protection. And given that India might actually have one of the largest historical populations of manta rays in the world, um, and the fact that it has you know, become one of the main sources for the manta ray trade in Hong Kong, China, and the rest of Asia, we, I felt a responsibility, and I'm sure Nithya also can agree, we felt a responsibility to make sure that we could actually take this documentary and work towards our impact goals. And we can talk more about what those were later as well. So Nithya, I just have to ask, do you dive with the manta rays as well? <laughs> yep, yep, I do. Uh, so I, I haven't been diving uh, since quite as long as Malaika has, uh, but I, I uh, we both of us learned free diving in order to film with manta rays in the Maldives. And uh, it, was, it was an incredible experience uh, to actually spend time with these majestic animals underwater. They're so gentle and so calm. And uh, that was just one of the most amazing parts of, the, of making this documentary. 
it, it sounds amazing. I've only done a little bit of diving with rays and, and you're absolutely right. They're just magical. They really are. Yeah. I understand this completely. So I had to ask. Um, so, you know, I've been working this summer on research um, on impact media um, sponsored by HHMI Tangle Bank Studios. And um, one of the approaches I took is to really look at kind of the holistic picture of impact and not just the outreach campaign after the film is done. And I think it's uh, you know so important to proceed in the way that you did where you're thinking about impact right at the inception of the project. But we also don't think so much or at least discuss as much maybe the, the, the whole picture of the creative design decisions that can have impact, the alliances and collaborations that can have impact and then the outreach strategies as well. So I'd love for you to break that down. Like what were some of the creative decisions you made that you felt would really help the film have more impact? And then what were some of the um, alliances and collaborations that you formed for that? I think at the very outset, um, from, from Malaika's personal experience that she just described, we wanted to, we wanted we were clear that we would we want to tell a story where we kind of follow three distinct phases or steps in the storytelling. Uh, the first being introducing the audience to manta rays, um, because not not a lot of people are familiar with the species, especially in India. Not too many people know about them, and those who do don't know that they exist in Indian waters. So, what Malaika spoke about her connection with them and how she's been diving. Uh, with manta rays since a very young age, we wanted to bring that emotion out um, to begin with so that at the very outset, we first make the audiences care about the animal. Um, and then, you know, uh, uh, trace the trade, trade, trace what's happening to these animals, where they're being caught, where, what are they being used for, who's transporting them, and then end with, um, the, the impact campaign end with uh, talking about what can be done about this, the, the solution part of it. And we felt like that would be um, the best way to make audiences care and take them along this journey where at the end of it, they would want, they would be rooting for change and uh, would want that to happen. I think building off on that point, at the end of a documentary, you know, an audience has kind of been taken into a story and that's your opportunity as a filmmaker to say, you're invested now, you're invested in this species, you're invested in this ecosystem and here's what you can do to protect it. Here's what policymakers can do. And I think that at the end of the documentary, we really wanted to have the fact that, you know, we wanted to have the impact campaign demonstrated. So you can actually see the end. There's parts where I'm talking to policymakers, there's parts where we're meeting with scientists who are running different parts of our campaign, which was the research campaign side of things. And we wanted that to kind of be woven into the film's fabric. Because when you have that in the narrative, when you have that um, towards the end in an impactful way, the hope is that your audience member watches that and says, okay, that's what they're aiming for. And when you have that intentionality about what you're doing with the documentary, I think the odds of actually being successful with your final goals is a little bit higher. Very much so. And, and you know, the other thing that strike, struck me about, excuse me, the other thing that struck me about in the film is how much you just take us on that journey. I mean, as a viewer, you really feel like right there with you, you know, in this intense investigation, dangerous at times, right? And, and you really take us on that journey. So was that, um, was that something that you were very intentional about from the beginning that you wanted to do that kind of style? Yeah, I think I've been presenting for about five years now. And usually when I'm on camera, it's a bit more, I think about what I'm going to say. I'm, you know, a bit more deliberate about it. But with this film, I was just myself on camera pretty much, you know, 100% of the time. I was scared at times. I was, you know, pretending to be a seafood trader at times. I was, you know, just going to different situations pretty much every single day while we were shooting for this. And I just wanted to be authentic on camera as a presenter. And I think that kind of came out through the journey because I wanted to show people the different aspects of the trade in a way that is relatable. And I think that after the documentary got completed, I mean, actually before even, we created these rushes of the film. So just basically foot footage from the different parts of the documentary that showed the scale of the trade. 
and in terms of our collaborations with researchers and with scientific organizations, I reached out to the Wildlife Trust of India, which is one of India's best research and advocacy organizations, and to WildAid, which is an international anti-trafficking organization. And we were able to create a really cool partnership between um, an anti-trafficking organization based in the US, a production house in India, and a research organization in India. And I think with this three-party organization, we managed to create India's first Manta and Mobula Ray Research Initiative, which is basically a multi-year project Project where we have a team of researchers out in the field collecting data almost every single day from 11 states and union territories in India where manta rays are being landed. And now that we have this whole repository of information, this baseline data, we now have a backing, right? It's sometimes a documentary can give you that emotion, but science can give you that impact and it can give you that, you know, that the strength of conviction to say that, hey, we have the data to back up the fact that these animals need protection. And my favorite part about working on this project, both the impact campaign and the film, was the fact that that just was one, you know, the science and the storytelling became one. And hopefully this is going to get us closer to our final goal, which is to get manta rays protection under India's Wildlife Protection Act. Yeah, and also I think when it comes to collaborating with organizations, um, every bit of um, contact that you have with organizations working on the issue uh, that you're making a film on helps. Um, for example, we were in touch with the Manta Trust uh, at the very beginning when we started filming and um, we traveled to the Maldives and actually, uh, you know, they very graciously allowed us to film off one of their research vessels. Um, you know, so they had their um, biologists and oceanographers studying uh, manta ecology and Malaika and I were filming manta ray natural history for our film. But what came out of that um, partnership was that a few months later, uh, manta ray gill plates were seized at the border. Um, the local uh, authorities there contacted uh, Seva Seas. Seva Seas contacted Manta Trust and Manta Trust was like, hey, we know these people who are making a film on Manta Ray, let's contact them. And that's how we were able to cover that story and actually travel to Manipur and film and, and talk to the people who were involved in seizing the Manta Ray gills and have that be a part of the story, which um, is, is one of the more, um, which, which I think is a very interesting part of the investigation because it's not, it's not the fishermen, it's not the traders, but it's, it, it deals with the, the, the transport of the contraband across borders, which is something we wouldn't have had if we didn't have those channels open and if we didn't get that access. Yeah, I mean, that's a, it's amazing that you have that kind of access, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and that's um, something where you, you know, when you align yourself with people and you build that trust over time, then it opens up a lot of doors. And one of the things that came out of the research and looking at a lot of different films this summer was understanding how particularly newer films really are embracing an idea of having the journey itself, the, the journey of the film process be the, act, be the impact, right? The journey of the film process is impact. It's not just what happens to the film afterwards. Because you're forming these alliances, because you're building trust among, across you know, different organizations. So along the way, there's a lot happening there. Um, I would love for you to talk about some of the clips that you're gonna show. And um, so if you can just, I think we have four clips. If you can set, um, set up the first one and let us know you know, a little bit about the clip and, and how, you know, what, what uh, does it represent in terms of your impact media campaign? So the first clip is in a store in Hong Kong, which actually is a store that sells a lot of manta ray gill plates. And we wanted to show the scale of the trade. And if you watch the video, you basically see the seafood trader saying to me that they have 1000 kilograms of manta rays. That's a sizable population of manta rays if you look at the numbers, right? And the reason why we, we thought this film was, you know, the reason why we thought this particular clip was important was because it shows the audience the scale of the trade. And when you have that set up early in the film, everything that comes after, whether that is your impact goal, whether that is the process behind making the film, or whether that is just the story in general, everything just comes together in a much stronger way. So when you watch this 
particular clip, you will understand that, you know, these animals are being threatened and there's a sense of urgency. And I think that sense of urgency really helped us with both crafting the narrative, but also with the work that we're doing on the ground with grassroots organizations. All right, we'll watch the clip now. I try to have a few sips of the soup, but I struggle to get myself to actually drink Manta Gill soup. Every experience I've ever had with mantas all my life comes rushing back to me in that moment. In conversation, it comes up that these traders have been supplying large numbers of manta gills for a few years now. We brought them a little further. <laughs> I asked him, like, um, if we want to do a long-term relationship, we have to make sure and ensure that quality and the quantity. Yeah. What about it goes exchange, like, shark? Oh. And then he said, that, like, he thinks it's not going to happen because it's, like, it's in a big ocean. Can... So he thinks that we can keep importing from him every single year, yeah, thousands of kgs, like, yeah, yeah. and it just won't go extinct. I really want to push them further and see if we can get a glimpse of their stock. Can they arrange for 500 kg of gill crates in the next two days? 500 kg? Yeah. They do? 1,000 1,000 kg. They can arrange for 1,000 kg. And so one of the things that I thought was so interesting about that particular clip is that it, it makes it very clear how big this problem is. It's not just a small problem in one part of a country, you know, affecting a few people. This is global. This is immense. I mean, it's just really hits home. And, and as you said, it provides that sense of urgency immediately. So we really get caught up, swept up into the story right away. Um, so with this particular clip, I think with this particular clip, what makes it stand out is that it shows the transnational nature of the trade. This is not a trade that only India has to deal with, that only China has to deal with, that only the US has to deal with. This, I mean, animals by default travel across borders, but so does the wildlife trade. And I think that what, that kind of emphasizes the need for international collaboration when it comes to addressing problems related to the wildlife trade. And we really wanted to bring that out in the documentary. Yeah, it's, it's, it certainly um, sends a message of how complicated conservation can be. You know, there's so many layers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this next, the next um, clip is about the, um, the smugglers, right? The, the trading company um, smugglers. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so, so the second clip is uh, from the part of the film where Malaika tracks down uh, the very same traders who were responsible for the shipment of manta ray gills that was seized by the authorities on the northeastern border with, with Burma. Um, and what's, I think what's really interesting about this part of the story is that uh, after tracking down the same trader and, and speaking to them, uh, what comes out is that this particular trader has stopped the, you know, dealing in manta ray gills. Um, and that's really interesting because that kind of goes on to show that with policy change, if consignments are being seized, if there is awareness that can have an effect on the trade. If, if it's dissuaded one trader from, you know, exporting these products, uh, if this kind of, if, if there is policy protection and if it's enforced, it can have a uh, ground impact, you know, impact on the ground. Chennai, South India's largest city and a trading super hub. This is where my investigation comes full circle. One of my local contacts here has helped me track down the same trafficker who sees consignment Alex was transporting across the Indo-Myanmar border. The 200 kilograms of manta ray gill plates that we found in the Northeast actually originated right here in Chennai. And I'm meeting with Pugal, a fisherman turned conservationist, who's going to help me to arrange a meeting with these very traders who were sending this consignment. I sent you the number, right? Mm. Can you just give them a call? Hello, sir. Pugal sets up the meeting. The story is the same. I'm a buyer from a seafood company and I'm looking for suppliers. Oh. 
I'm just about to go into the trader's office and I really doubt that they'll talk to us if we walk in with cameras. So we're going to be filming with just our phones this time and let's see what we get. Wow. I mean, I, I'm constantly reminded by this film that, that it's such a commitment on the part of the filmmakers to just keep pushing that story and keep looking for ways to bring different aspects of the issue into, um, into the narrative. And, and with that, and I do wonder how, you know, the, again, the, I'd love to have been a fly in the wall with your conversations, um, that, you know, when you're thinking about what elements to put in a film, because a film like this is so enormous, you know, you have to, have to make those really tough decisions about what you're putting in and what you're taking out, what you're leaving, you know, on the cutting room floor, as we used to say. Um, so how do you make those decisions? Why, 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 was, um, why was it so important to include that particular clip? I think with this particular clip, it kind of speaks about the fact that, you know, when it comes to the wildlife trade in India with, with manta rays, it's not just the fact that, you know, it's being exported all the way to Hong Kong and Guangzhou. It also, there's big stakes in India itself. And in this particular store in Chennai, it was dangerous. I mean, honestly, I was more scared going undercover in India than I was in Hong Kong and China, because when you go undercover in another country, you can get away with a lot more because you're an outsider, you're a foreigner now. When you go undercover in your own country, they can see through the fact that you're probably not a seafood trading company, that you might have a camera tucked in your, in your pocket. And we wanted the audience to kind of be drawn into the story of what it was like behind the scenes, right? I mean, this sequence also doesn't have a camera in parts. In some parts of the sequence, we actually just filmed it on our phones. Um, and I think that showcasing that and just meeting this trader who's had a complete 360 degree shift from being someone who was transporting 200 kilograms of manta rays pretty much every single month to Burma and then to China to completely stopping. I think as a filmmaker, when you're making creative decisions about what works and what doesn't work in a documentary, one of the things that I'd like to emphasize is that you wanna have a bit of hope. You wanna show that, okay, this is our goal, but this is what hope looks like. And you know, if such a small action such as and a consignment being seized can result in this kind of change. Imagine what would happen if we got these animals listed in India's Wildlife Protection Act. And that's what I wanted to really drill home with the sequence. I have to say at that point, I was really, I was rooting for the manta rays, but I was rooting for you too. Because <laughs> it did look really scary. I mean, really, that's a, that's a pretty risky undertaking, you know. Um, so, so bravo, congratulations on that. Um, okay, the next, uh, the next uh, clip really gets at the, the criminal syndicates, right? And uh, so why don't you tell us a little bit about this one? So the next clip that we have over here talks about how it's the criminal syndicates that are responsible for the extinction, the near extinction of the species, right? And if the species were to go extinct in the next 10 years, it would be these criminal syndicates who would be at fault and not the fishermen. So often we blame the smallest of players, the people who are just out there to feed their families, to just get three meals on the table for their families. And as a documentary filmmaker, I think we have a very strong responsibility to ensure that we represent the story in an appropriate journalistic and accurate way. And with this particular clip um, on camera and my piece to camera, I talk about how it's not the fishermen who are at fault, it's the criminal syndicates. And even then it requires larger structural changes. And the second part of the clip focuses on our collaboration with the different research organizations on the ground. And I thought it was really cool to have that included in because these communities that we're working with on the ground really make our impact campaign come together. So we, as a presenter, I don't just want to take all the limelight and just be there and talk about the work that we're doing because it is these researchers on the field who are facilitating this impact. And having that woven into the film with this clip just made that difference. Yeah, and I think we were, throughout the process of filming, we were always struck by how, whether it's the fishermen or it's, you know, the person who's hired to cut up the manta gills and extract the, cut up the manta and extract the gills and dry them, or the person who's transporting the gills to the local market, they're not really, for them, it's not about the bigger picture. For them, it's about the day-to-day, -day, it's about survival. And you have to have that kind of uh, empathy. You cannot, uh, you cannot just paint everyone in that 
you know, pipeline with the same brush. Um, you need to see who are the people who are making a conscious decision to deal in, you know, a product that is leading to, uh, leading to widespread hunting of a species which may lead to its extinction and who are the people who are doing it for their bread and butter. And we wanted to make sure that in our film, the audiences should not come away hating on fishermen or the, you know, the small scale guy. Uh, mm. it, it, the, that perspective was very important for us. And I think the cool thing that we kind of discovered, um, it was interesting when we went undercover in Hong Kong and Guangzhou, um, we met with uh, a traditional Chinese medicine practitioner. And this traditional Chinese medicine practitioner talked to us about the inception of the trade. And the mandatory trade kind of came out of the fact that shark stocks were declining. And as a result, these business people who are pushing the trade forward really needed to find an alternative. And mandatory has kind of emerged as the alternative um, contraband in this situation. So um, we started to speak to this, this these uh, traditional Chinese practitioners more. And what we realized was that very often, a lot of them are saying that this trade doesn't have any basis. It's bad for you from a public health perspective. These manta rays are really toxic. They bioaccumulate as they swim through the ocean. So it's really bad, especially for the target audience, which is young women who are breastfeeding and you know people who have ailments it's terrible to have that kind of toxicity in your body um and the reason that it's been you know so widespread in hong kong and guangzhou and other parts of china is because of the fact that it's been marketed and that's one of the things we wanted to bring out that this is just like the drug trade or the arms trade or human trafficking it is large in scale and needs to be seen with the same level of intensity i mean the wildlife trade needs to be seen as a priority area for conservation. And that's what we want to do with this documentary in a, in a way. I mean, yes, it does focus on manta rays, but at a broader level, it does focus on why the wildlife trade needs to be tackled with urgency. And COVID-19 has only proven how this is more urgent than we ever thought. Over the course of my investigation, I've realized that when it comes to this trade pipeline, the fishermen aren't the bad actors here. They are driven by circumstance of putting food on the table for their families and getting through yet another day. But with current levels of fishing, these species will soon be extinct and as a result, their livelihoods will be compromised. As long as Indian middlemen can buy manta gills freely at Indian harbours and traders can send them across the border without once breaking the law, this trade will continue to grow. And I've got to figure out a way to stop this. I'm teaming up with the Wildlife Trust of India in the nation's capital, New Delhi. This organization has a long-standing legacy of being at the forefront of conservation solutions and policy what advocacy. There are large landings of both mobula and manta rays, obviously more mobulas, okay. um, mm -hmm. all across the coast. And the fishermen are saying that all of this is not being used domestically. It's all going to the traders in Chennai. And then from Chennai, it's going all the way to Hong Kong and China. Okay. So I think one of the uh, major objective of the study is to get the hotspot of the landing. Yes. We can identify that particular thing based on the survey. But at the same time, it would be good to kind of get the perception of the fishers and work. Is there any distribution or aggregation sites yes. for the mantas? I think then the plan would be to get two researchers in the field dedicated working on this for the next six months. And at mm -hmm. the end of it, we'll have a baseline data understanding of, you know, what the manta ray landings are. Mm -hmm. And then we can create a formalized report to send to the Ministry of Environment and Forests. So one of the things I just want to come back to is, is that idea of empathy, because I think an effective film, a film that really grabs an audience, does that. And, and that, um, you know, you have so many different um, emotional and science elements to this film. I mean, you, you know, you definitely have the empathy there. There's kind of the investigative and the fear and the adrenaline rush and the, and then there's, you know, so much information, but not that dry information. You wove it into the story in really a brilliant way. You know, it's just, I felt like every scene I was learning something new, but through the story, not kind of separate. And that weaving of the science and the creative, the emotional range, and then the information really came together. Really, really so well done. Thank you. Um, 
You're welcome. I really, I love your film. Um, you, you probably didn't, didn't get that from me at all, right? <laughs> no. Um, so this last, um, this last one is uh, lobbying for policy change impact, uh, and um, and you've spoken a couple of times already about this. But the idea that you wanted to put this uh, kind of um, scene into the film to engage audiences about the impact and the type of impact strategies that you can have to affect and change policy and that you wanted that right in the film so that we as viewers can embrace that and go yes there, there is hope there are ways to make change here and and you provide an excellent example of how to do that so um do you want to set this clip up a little bit i think malaika should take this uh, she'd be better placed to talk about this mm -hmm. So this particular clip focuses on the impact campaign that was done with policymakers and with people who work in different ministries that regulate the fisheries trade in India. And it focuses on how I basically went into this place in Kochi, which is in southern India, for a marine conference where we were talking about the different trade and policy um, aspects of the Elasmo brand trade, which is sharks and rays across India. And during this um, you know, meeting, I was able to present the results of our work, the investigation and the research campaign. And it was one of the first times that we really got manta rays um, in the spotlight, the, really the first time that we were able to get you know, people to sit up and take notice and realize that these animals are threatened and that they need our urgent attention. So it was exciting because that day when we presented it, we got a lot of people on board from different government ministries and different regulatory organizations just with footage, right? Just with footage of these animals, both swimming in the water peacefully and also being killed. And I think that that's the power of documentaries. You know, people might read about something a thousand times but when they watch a film and they see that okay, that's what it looks like. It hits home. It goes back to the point of empathy, right? It makes you feel certain things. And I think that even the most experienced administrator, the most experienced politician or policymaker, when you tug at their heartstrings and then say, this is what you can do, that's when you can make a difference. Um, and we obviously haven't gotten to our impact goal yet. It's probably going to be a long way until we can get manta rays legal protection under India's Wildlife Act. Um, but I'm not going to stop trying, and I don't think we're going to stop trying. Our team is dedicated to this goal. And regardless of how long it takes, we're in it for the long run. And I think this clip shows that. It was very important for us to include within the film these visuals of speaking to stakeholders and policymakers. Um, to show that you have to keep pushing, you have to keep chipping away at it, and the process has begun. And as we go along, if we can get more support, it's the move, the, the, the push to protect these animals is only going to get stronger. And as a filmmaker and an editor, I, while editing, I remember thinking that these visuals are not really cinematic, should we have them in? They're not filmed mm. that well. But finally, I, you know, it just, we felt like this has to be a part of the story and we decided to just include it uh, just because of how uh, strong a point that made. Yeah, I think the video was actually filmed by the tech guy. So I was at this conference alone and there was a tech guy who was basically just in charge of just getting the presentations on. And I was like, hey, here's my camera. Can you please take a video of me talking? Because we might want that in the film. Um, and I think that's, you know, it, it was a scrappy process. It was really, really scrappy throughout just making this documentary. Very often we were filming in places where we couldn't use a camera because of just safety reasons. Um, and I think the fact that this film has been nominated in the impact category as a really, really small budget, two person team film, um, hopefully that inspires other filmmakers out there, people who are young like us, to kind of just go out there and believe that when you make a documentary, if you care enough about the subject, it is possible to change things on the ground in a tangible way. It is possible to have that impact. You don't have to be an enormous production house or a big network. You can be someone, um, you know, just starting out with a camera. And if you believe that your story has the power to change things and you drive that home, I mean, just really follow through with it, things can change. Yeah, and to add to Malika's point, even if you're just a, a big, big enough filmmaker with a camera, I think if you want to achieve some kind of impact, if you want, if, if that is your goal, I think you're never too inexperienced or too young to, uh, 
to reach out to organizations that are working in that space. Uh, that you may get a response, you may not, but that always puts you in touch with the right people and they can help you along. Maybe it may, it may come to, it may yield some kind of, uh, you know, a, a positive result later on. Uh, but always, I think filmmakers should get in touch with organizations that are working on the issue that you, you're making a film on. I'm in the city of Kochi right now and I'm here to join marine scientists and policy makers from across the country for a consultative policy workshop on sharks and rays organized by the Central Marine Fisheries Research Institute of India. And over the next couple of days we will be coming up with a draft list of species to be included in India's Wildlife Protection Act. And my goal is to get manta rays and mobula rays on that list for the first time ever. So we finished an initial field investigation of the contraband route from India to China. It's interesting, when I go undercover in China pretending to be a seafood trader, I've come across hundreds and thousands of kilos. Just a couple of months back, I came across 1,000 kgs of gill plates in um, Hong Kong. And when I was talking to some of the traders over there, they were telling me that a lot of it is coming from India, and that India in the last few years has actually emerged as their main source. So this is an issue that needs to be resolved within a shorter span of time, in my opinion. I would like to end with saying that from our time in the field, even though you know certain international policy documents might not list manta rays as critically endangered, the trade right now is only accelerating in its vastness and in its amount. So we definitely need to be very proactive right now and protect these species while we still can. And we need all of your help for that. Thank you. What this clip always illustrates to me is, is exactly what you said about, you know, there's nothing like the power of visuals to wake people up. And, um, you know, there's, there's, for policymakers, often it comes in those printed reports or really dry material. And then if, when they see something like, like this kind of video material, it's, it's just a different reaction. It's such an emotional, visceral reaction. Um, and, and then you do understand the power of media and what media can do to change people, to change opinions, to change policy. So um, yeah, I think it worked so well to put that in the film. And you know, I was thinking about um, the journey you take us on, again, through all these different parts of this global trade the from from the very simple to the very complex and yet you're just two people and that message is so important that it doesn't take an entire machine to make a film that can have impact that it really takes the commitment and the passion you're starting your careers you know a lot of people 30 years from now will not made this kind of film um, but you're just starting your film your careers and you've made this amazing film um, so i have two questions for you one um, was there anything you wish you'd done differently? And secondly, what advice would you give to others? Hmm. Wow, that's something that I've got to think about, the first one. Um... So, to be honest, um, this, this film took a while to make. Uh, we, Malika and I worked on it for about three, three and a half, well, almost four years actually. And we started working on it when we were just really beginning out as filmmakers. And every, the, the process of, the, of making the film itself was one that was in phases. You know, we would go film in, in the landing sites and then come back. And then we would, it would take us a few months to get the next shoot lined up and then we would go film the next thing. And I think we grew up as filmmakers as well while making the film. So uh, fr from a technical standpoint, I think we were much better with cameramen and presenters and directors towards the end of it uh, as compared to when we were, when we were starting out. Um, so in terms of doing things differently, I mean, that, that's, that's difficult to say. It, like because because we grew as filmmakers a lot towards the end of it, there are lots of things we look back at and say, "Hey, we could have filmed this better. We could have used better equipment. Uh, the camera work could have been better." Uh, 
but having said that, I think that that's no reason to not have started when we started. We, you we really, would, you have to dive in, right? I mean, exactly. Exactly. At the beginning, um, I'm 19 at the beginning of the film and 23 at the end. So it's like, I, like you said, we literally grew up while making this documentary and we were working on different broadcast projects as well and different species. But this film's kind of been the consistent film throughout. And it's like, now that it's done and, you know, wrapped up and soon it's going to be on broadcast, hopefully next year. It's like, you know, having a kid who's going to college, it literally feels like that. Um, and I think that, you know, if I were to give someone else who's starting out in making a documentary like this, um, any advice? I would say be easy with yourself. I mean, just don't be so hard on yourself. Because like I said, when I started out as a 19 year old director and presenter, the, honestly, the on camera bits made me cringe. So when I got nominated in the presenter category for this film, I was like, I can't believe this. You know, it just didn't seem right almost. But um, I think that's sometimes as young filmmakers, we have an understanding or a perception of what we think are impactful films or what we think are films that make it to television. And that's because of the stuff that we've watched growing up, right? But for anyone out there, sometimes it's just about making the film that you care about and being your authentic, true self on camera, behind the camera and in the storytelling. And if there hasn't been a film like that before, that's okay. Yours will be the first and that's super cool as well. So just be unafraid, be brave and go out there and make the film that, you know, you're going to look back at in 10 years and be like, wow, I could have done that better, but I'm so glad I did it. Also, I think um, we never imagined that we would end up making a 55-minute film, uh, which would span so many different aspects of this story. Uh, this film grew in its scope and ambition and uh, scale as we went along with it. So to, to anyone who, who wants to make a film and hopes to create impact, I would say, don't be daunted by the scale of it. Don't be daunted by how, how big a film you want to end up making. Just start chipping away at it. Take it shoot by shoot. Uh, there, were, there were periods in between where for six or seven months, we were working on something else. And we were trying to figure out how to get our next shoot going. Where should we go? How should we make that happen? Um, we always... I mean, don't be afraid of asking people for help. We, we stayed in, stayed with friends sometimes, borrowed equipment when we had to. So it really, it's about having that story. You may not know the full story. You might not have the full story in your mind, but having an idea and then chasing after it and um, getting at it bit by bit and, and seeing where you can take it. I, I, again, I am so impressed with this film and, and I just want to say really congratulations. You are both fearless and I think that's a strong message too. Um, and fearless in pursuing your passion, fearless in really getting in there on the street, discovering things, revealing things to, to, to the audience um, and, and following through with something that's going to make a real difference, you know, and, and to have that tenacity, that commitment, that passion um, speaks volumes. And I, I just wish that we were all watching the film at Jackson Wild <laughs> and then being able to talk about it and have that buzz in the hallways afterwards, right? <laughs> But next year, we hope. And, and this is such a pleasure to talk with both of you. And thank you so much. And, and congratulations again on the film, on your Impact Media campaign. And I, I wish you all the best going forward. I can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you so thank much, you. Max. Thanks. It's, a pleasure speaking it, with you. it's been great speaking with you.